Welcome back to Zone of Tech News, episode number 20 already. Uh, and a lot of stuff has happened this week in the world of tech. So the Pixel 4, for example, was officially revealed once again. Uh, Samsung launched a new Galaxy Tab S tablet. Then we have some more leaks regarding the big new 16-inch MacBook Pro redesign. LG has released a brand new ultra-fine 5K display, by the way. And then Apple actually bought Intel's modem division. So get a snacks ready, those drinks, everything you need, because this is going to be an exciting one. And here's everything that happened this week. To keep your Mac running fast and secure, check out Intego's Premium Bundle X9 that includes a number of very useful tools for your Mac. Use the link below to get a 60% discount. Okay, so Google has given us another teaser at their upcoming Pixel 4. Yes, they've given us the first teaser a few days after Onlyx posted his render of the Pixel 4, uh, and that's when Google tweeted, well, since there seems to be some interest, here we go. Wait till you see what it can do. And they showed us the official render of the back of the Pixel 4. But you see, that was just the back. We didn't know how the front was going to look like. Was it going to have a notch or a cutout like Samsung does it? Or will it have a full bezel display like on the OnePlus 7 Pro and a pop-up camera instead? Well, none of these actually. So Unleaks did post a render of the front of the Pixel 4 a few days later and then we also made our own Pixel 4 render based on that. Now, just a few weeks later, and we now have another official reveal by Google of the front of the Pixel 4 this time in a brand new tweet saying, look internet, no hands. Yes, this not only confirms the front of the Pixel 4, which will have that pretty big bezel, so no more notch this time, but it also confirms something even bigger, uh, that a Pixel 4 will come with Google's Project Soli chip. This is something that I've talked about in the previous Google Pixel 4 video, as well as in our Google Pixel Watch video. So essentially what this is, is that it's a tiny, tiny chip that uses radio waves to measure the position of your hands and your fingers. And it can do that much more accurately than a camera can, which means that you can control your phone uh, from the air by using gestures very, very accurately. Now, in the actual Project Soli videos, which is a Google-sponsored project, uh, they showed us how this could work on smart watches. Not smart phones, but smart watches. And you know, when you have a really small display, uh, this is where you'll want to use those gestures on, so that you do not block a portion of that display, which is already very, very small. On a smartphone, Soli doesn't make that much sense, at least not in my opinion. Since, first of all, you need to prop the phone up on a stand, and then you need to swipe your hands through the air which is unfortunately uh, just to swipe between photos or I don't know what useful controls you could have on a smartphone uh, that you cannot already do just by, you know, touching the display. But this is exactly what Google has showed us in that tweet. So they showed us how the Pixel 4 would be using motion sense. This is apparently how this feature would be called, which by the way would not be available in all regions for some reason. Uh, but this woman just swipes through the apps or photos, which again, I don't really see the point of. It's pretty cool, but I don't really see the point of. Leave a like and subscribe if you remember the Galaxy S4 from 2013, so that phone actually came with air gestures. That was pretty cool. So you could control the phone by just using your palm, pretty much the same thing that a Pixel 4 would support. So air gestures, um, and Samsung ended up killing air gestures, by the way, just because, well, they were a gimmick in the end. But something that is definitely not a gimmick is actually the first thing that you see in Google's tweet. So as soon as the person comes into the frame, he has the Pixel 4 unlocks. The Pixel 4 will indeed have actual 3D depth mapping and face unlock, just like the iPhone 10 does. And I'm not talking about that face unlock that all Android smartphones use today, in which they just use the front-facing camera and they look for your face. That's not secure at all. Instead, just like on the iPhone 10 and newer, Google creates a 3D depth map of your face. Google even posted a detailed article of how this would work. So here are all the sensors that that thick top bezel would hold. So we have a face unlock infrared camera on both the left and the right hand sides, which is very interesting because Apple, for example, only uses one. We then have the front facing camera, which is quite interesting that we only have one rather than two like we had on the Pixel 3s. So does this mean that group selfies and that wide angle lens are going away? Probably not. Uh, this could just be the Pixel 4, and maybe we will be getting this on a Pixel 4 XL, or it could be that Google would only use just wide-angle module and then zoom in and distort the image so that it looks normal when you just want a regular non-wide selfie. Anyway, uh, then we have the ambient light and proximity sensors, then we have the top speaker grill, and then we have that Soli Radar chip. Uh, you can see how much space it takes when compared to the sensors to the right, which are a dot projector and a flood illuminator. Again, just like Apple uses on 
on the iPhone 10 and newer. So uh, this is this is great. But what's even better is that according to Google's article, uh, their version of Face ID works in conjunction with the Soleil Radar sensor, which basically means that as you physically reach your phone to unlock it, it would actually sense you, activate Face ID, uh, scan your face and also unlock it in the blink of an eye. You know, on the iPhone you have to tap the display, then you have to wait for Face ID to recognize you, and then you have to swipe up to unlock it. Google's version is much more streamlined than this. And then if we take another closer look at Google's tweet, you can see that the Pixel 4 actually unlocks when she's approaching it. Yes, she doesn't even have to tap the display or lift the phone or anything like that. So yeah, this is, uh, this is really cool. Let me know in the comments what are your thoughts on the Pixel 4, and definitely make sure to watch our previous videos on the Pixel 4 and the Pixel Watch for more details on both. Next up, Samsung has unveiled their brand new Galaxy Tab S6. So this is their new flagship tablet after the Tab S4, which was launched in August 2018. Now, Samsung did launch the Galaxy Tab S5e earlier this year, but they have totally skipped over the Tab S5 as the S5e lacks a lot of features that the S4 had. So the S5e is more similar to the entry-level iPad or the iPad Air rather than an iPad Pro that the Tab S4 and the Tab S6 were aimed at. The Tab S6 now features S Pen support, which the S5e does not. And it also adds this unique way of attaching a pencil on the back rather than to the side. Uh, and I do think that this is a great idea as long as Samsung is using a strong magnet, because if they're not, then this is going to be a pain to carry around, as the pencil would most likely fall every time. And the Tab S6 also has a really nice keyboard attachment, uh, which also has a trackpad. And then the keys themselves do look like they have a very good key travel when compared to something like the iPad Pro's keyboard, and at the same time the keyboard is also very very thin, and it also has its stand on the back so you can position this at any angle you want. So yeah, pretty much the best keyboard attachment for a tablet from the looks of it at least. We then get a dual camera module on the back for the first time, uh, so we also have a wide angle module now just like on the S10 and the Note 10. Then the S6 also comes with a Snapdragon 855 processor, uh, six gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage as the baseline versus the Snapdragon 670, four gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage uh, that the baseline S5e came with. It is a bit thicker at 5.7 millimeters thin versus 5.5 that we had on the S5e, but even that's still thinner than, yes, even the 2018 iPad Pro, which is 5.9 millimeters thin, and that thing is extremely, extremely thin. So yeah, overall, if you're looking to replace your laptop, this is actually a much better version than an iPad Pro uh, because you have full Samsung DeX support, so you can turn this thing into a desktop-like experience by connecting it to a monitor, adding a keyboard and a mouse. And what's really cool about the S5e and also the S6 is that uh, you can actually do this all internally without the need to connect it to a monitor in the first place. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts on the new Galaxy Tab S6. By the way guys, if you have a Galaxy S10 or you're looking to get the Note 10, we're actually doing a second giveaway of the Samsung Galaxy Buds. These are Samsung's own truly wireless headphones with no cable in between, and uh, if you have an S10 or a Note 10, you can actually charge these headphones from the back of that phone. <laughs> How cool is that? To enter the giveaway, just follow on Instagram at Zenoftech and leave a comment on this post with our Samsung Galaxy Note 10 renders saying why do you want to win the Galaxy Buds and I'll be announcing the winner uh, on September the 2nd via Instagram DM and story. And now a few more updates on Apple's upcoming 16 inch MacBook Pro. Digitimes Taiwan did release a more recent report just two days ago on the fact that Apple will release an updated MacBook Pro in September with a 16-inch display and also an ultra-thin and narrow bezel. Now, interesting enough, this report does say that a new 16-inch MacBook Pro would be around the same size as the current 15-inch model is. Now, in our previous MacBook Pro 16-inch video, that 18-minute long one, I went through all the details and all the leaks that we knew, and by using a DPI calculator, I found that the display would have to be 16.4 inches in size or then 16 inches like it was leaked. In order for Apple to have that leaked resolution of uh, 3072 by 1920 and the next ratio is 16 by 10 and the same PPI that Apple currently has on the 15 inch model. Apple actually does this a lot, so they keep the same PPI when they release a new uh, design with a larger display uh, so that the retina scaling works the same. Now with a 16.4 inch display, the MacBook Pro would have to be larger. You cannot, you just cannot fit a 16.4 inch display in the form factor that we have now. The only way that you can do that is if you completely remove the bottom chin as well, and you also increase the aspect ratio so that you have an even taller aspect ratio than 16 by 10. And then ming Chico has released a table on how the keyboards on the new MacBook Pros uh, and the new MacBooks would actually be made, what material they would be made from, and what, what type of keyboards these new MacBooks would feature. And according to this, in 2019, only the 16-inch MacBook Pro redesign would be getting that brand new scissors keyboard. 
Now, in case you don't know, the scissors mechanism is what Apple was using before in the pre-2016 MacBook Pros, and those actually had the best keyboard that I've ever used in a laptop. Those keys were amazing, but unfortunately Apple wanted to make them thinner, and they completely messed up in the current design. Uh, by adding the new butterfly key switch mechanism, which was really thin and constantly broke, and Apple released a few replacement programs, yeah, that was horrible. But now it seems like they're going back to a more traditional mechanism, starting with the new 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro. And then in 2020, all the MacBooks, including the 13-inch MacBook Pro, the 15.6-inch MacBook Pro, and the MacBook Air, they would all be getting these new uh, scissors mechanisms for the keyboard. Uh, also, from this table, yes, it does show that Apple would be keeping the current design, the 13.3-inch and the 15.6-inch, into next year as well, rather than, you know, removing the 15.6-inch, having it replaced with a 16-inch MacBook Pro, and then also replacing the 13-inch with a 14-inch MacBook Pro. Um, personally, I do think that Apple would release a 14-inch MacBook Pro next year with a 16-inch MacBook Pro redesign. And speaking of this new MacBook Pro, Apple has just released an updated version of the LG Ultrafine 5K monitor that they released in partnership with LG back in 2016 when this generation of MacBook Pros came out. I do have the original model and it's absolutely stunning. So it uses a glossy 5K 27-inch IPS panel, uh, which is also 10 bits, and this is the same exact panel that you would find in a 5K iMac. And yes, aside from, from an iMac, this is currently the best display for content creation that you can get. You know, 5K display, 500 nits of brightness, 10-bit panel, that thing is just amazing. Now, what this new monitor does is that it also lets you connect an iPad Pro to it. Previously, you couldn't do that because it only supported Thunderbolt, but now it also supports USB Type-C. Uh, so display port by USB Type-C of, of up to 4K 60 Hertz. So yes, you are limited to 4K instead of 5K if you use USB Type-C compared to Thunderbolts, but at least you can use USB Type-C devices, like even a 12-inch MacBook to connect to that and an iPad Pro. But something else that I've noticed about this monitor is that it also supports 94 watts of charging now, rather than 87 watts that the previous model supported. Now, for those of you who don't know, 87 watts is what the current 15-inch MacBook Pro needs. So with the previous monitor, you could actually charge a 15-inch MacBook Pro at full speed, whereas the new monitor actually offers more power. Now, in our previous MacBook Pro 16-inch video, I did talk about the upcoming Apple Pro XDR display, the fact that it actually supports 96 watts of power uh, via Thunderbolt 3. So now we have two monitors from Apple that support over 87 watts of power that the 15-inch MacBook Pro needs which does point towards, you know, the new 16-inch MacBook Pro being more power-hungry. And finally, probably the biggest news this week is that Apple has now bought Intel, well, not entirely, but at least Intel's smartphone modem division for $1 billion. Apple has actually been working with Intel on developing 5G modems for the iPhone 12 in 2020. Uh, this is because Apple and Qualcomm were in the process of lawsuits over patent infringements, uh, but Intel was behind schedule, and in the end, Apple decided to reach an agreement with Qualcomm and use Qualcomm's 5G modems in the 2020 iPhones instead. And Apple did mention that they were interested in developing their own 5G modems in the future, however, they didn't have the engineers and the knowledge to do so. So, as Intel has announced that they would be closing their smartphone modem division after uh, losing Apple as a client, Apple has now announced that it would be buying Intel's modem division for smartphones in order to focus on Apple's own 5G modems. This means that Apple will be gaining over 2,200 Intel employees and over 17,000 patents. Yes, this is actually Apple's second highest purchase ever uh, since buying Beats for $3 billion in 2014. But yeah, definitely let me know in the comments what do you guys think about everything that I talked about in this video. Uh, and definitely subscribe to notifications if you want to see more Zenof Tech News episodes such as this one was. And more interesting tech videos like, again, this one hopefully was. So yeah, thank you for watching the video. So like if you enjoyed it, so let me know. I'm Daniel, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Zenof Tech, signing out. Cheers.